Thank you. And I'm very, very happy to be here today and to hear the progress in the field, the important uh, challenges in front of us. And um, it's particularly exciting to see a very full room and a very attentive room. I'm noticing uh, the, uh, not only the sense of passion about the topic, but the urgency of the subject. Um, so the, in thinking about today, I want to first thank Shinchi and Jackie for their incredible leadership in getting this panel put together. Thank Judy Salerno for her leadership and Secretary Greenlee, not only for being here, but for staying with us, the, which is just so important to us all. We really appreciate that. So we will be having um, uh, uh, the, the context of global today, and you'll hear some of us touch on that a little more than others, and that has to do with the state of the science and, and what we must do next. I want to uh, really thank my co-panelists, and I think the flow of this panel is going to be very, very good. I'll be focusing on neglect by others. Kremlin will be focusing on self-neglect, and then we have the guru telling us about adult protective services and where we will really learn what we have to do next. I believe that so firmly, so uh, great panel. Um, let, me, let me tell you that um, my, the way I, that I want to present today is to show you data over time, research that has, has gone on over time, and I will be pulling out uh, neglect by others in those studies. Some of them might have had a different focus as their lead theme, but I'm going to be focusing on the neglect element. A couple of things that we've not talked about today, and I want to say them up front, is that we haven't talked on the important issue of intentionality, and that is when somebody means to do something or not. Now, that has been bandied about more in the law literature than in the health literature, but it is something that I think we'll keep coming back to, cognitive impairment, neglect versus abuse, using the term mistreatment. And, and I think that we'll hear more and more about the role of technology, which we heard uh, Bob Wallace touch on. Very, very important. My passion for elder abuse and neglect came as, as, uh, in my work as a staff nurse. It was very clear to me that two older people could roll into the emergency room um, about the same age with about the same number of chronic diseases and conditions and the same number of medications and present with extraordinary differences. Uh, one person's pressure ulcer was written off as old age, while another's was taken to be, an, to be uh, a symptom of terrible neglect or abuse. And it's captured my passion and imagination since then. And we've made some progress. And I think through conferences like these, we'll make more progress. Um, you know, I started my career in Massachusetts. Funny how things go around here. I'm back in Massachusetts. I'm working with the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, looking at their data. Massachusetts has, happens to be one of the states where it's mandatory that they discard their data at the end of each year. And so uh, the ability to follow people longitudinally is a little more challenging there, but I have great hopes that um, things are coming together. So the other thing that gives me a lot of hope is that um, I think that this, again, this conference today will really leapfrog us into what we need to do next. So my goal is to review studies that have data specific to neglect by others, document the paucity of data, show the lack of imagination in how we study neglect and ask why intervention studies are not uh, being reviewed favorably or funded and what each of us can personally do to change that. The definitions for neglect have been uh, touched on, but um, uh, to call it out, because we're talking about neglect now, the largest referral uh, for adult protective services as refuser or failure by those responsible to provide food, shelter, health care, or protection for a vulnerable elder, that's NCA website, or no, an omission by responsible caregivers that constitutes neglect under applicable federal or state law. Early studies, well, there's the, the, somebody who all of us loved and admired, Rosalie Wolf, along with, with uh, Carl and, and Andy Godkin, doing an early, think of this, 1984, we had data showing us with a case comparison that active neglect was going on in 20% of the cases, one in five of those cases in that very seminal initial study uh, with a case comparison on uh, elder abuse and neglect. Neglect had the strongest relationship to dependency. We, knew, we wrote this in 84. Cases had significant problems with cognitive and physical functioning. Neglect cases likely to be burdensome and stressful, and caregivers had their own stresses. So there it was. There are data. And following that, uh, I was very compelled by that. But my, my um, uh, studies really came from the fact that in 1970, 
2009, Massachusetts passed a mandatory reporting law for elder abuse and neglect in Massachusetts. And Dr. Rabkin asked me if I would respond to that law. We started an elder abuse team. It was clear that we needed a path for that. So we looked at all studies over 70. We saw that staff nurses could screen and would screen for elder mistreatment if you gave them strategies for it and supported their work. And then followed by um, using those data to develop an elder assessment index, taking a look at 107 cases in, in with an expert panel, and they really were quite expert, Ken Meineker, Terry O'Malley, Terry Weddle, for example, looked and found that uh, fact, using a factor analysis that nutritional deficits, alterations in skin integrity, and alterations in elimination, that is either urine burns or, or terrible problems with constipation or diarrhea, would always cluster together, and that we could look at those, and, and generally speaking, people thought that that was neglect. You know, prev here's, here's Carl and David Finkelhor's, Carl Pillimer and David Finkelhor's study on uh, the prevalence of elder abuse, me using this and calling it out in this rapid fire discussion of neglect this afternoon, and the fact that in that study, um, you see that 32 per thousand were maltreated, but four in a thousand were due to neglect, and the perpetrators in neglect were 29% husband-wife, we've heard that again today, 29% daughter-mother, and 42% other, meaning that it really wasn't clear to us then who was engaged in the neglect, but they did take a shot at characteristics, and we've heard them resonate again today, female, divorce, maybe a spouse or child, poor health, without a helper, and that neglect victims commonly are in poor health and report they do not have close context. There's a social context that we've heard uh, repeated today. Uh, another study looking at abuse, neglect, abandonment, violence, and exploitation analysis of all elderly patients seen in emergency rooms, and there's Shinji, uh, you know, the echoes that go on in this field. So there we were at Yale New Haven. Mark Lax was at Yale New Haven, which was a great thing. We screened all patients over 70 years presenting to the emergency department. Uh, we were funded by the VOCA uh, Victims of Crime Act funds during this study. All patients had an MMSE and an elder assessment instrument. We did follow-ups in the home. And now look, we, we, in following those cases, we saw again that neglect accounted for 55% of the cases. And so whether you have a study at, at this uh, with 126 cases, the patterns begin to repeat. And you see dominance of neglect. You see um, the fact that uh, there is a lot to know about this. And that, again, that 4% data following. And I want to point out that in that, this study, the Yale New Haven mistreatment study, 3,126 patient visits accounted for like 100. 1,975 1, people. So I'm telling you that there was a lot of re repeating emergency room visits, and there still are today, that people who come in, come in, and that we need to be looking uh, for neglect and abuse when people touch base in the emergency room. And we, we know that Shinchi's following that very strongly. This is uh, uh, the, the initial pilot study with, uh, and I think Mark is now doing college tours with his, with his son and had to go. No, there he is. So there's Mark Lax, the one and only, where um, Mark was so generous in working with me, thinking about the EPS data from YHAP, the Yale Health and Aging, doing a, a, a match on the uh, adult protective service data. 78% of EM cases involve neglect, 78%. And so the data continue to be so compelling. And there they are again, minority, female, less than eighth grade education, poor social networks. Um, following that, Mark then uh, went from the pilot to a nine-year observational cohort, comparing those groups again. 64% experienced neglect by another party. Mortality. Uh, in a study looking at the contribution of neglect to all cases, uh, all cause mortality, 176 to older adults, 30, 17 percent were for cases of neglect. Neglect, neglect, mortality and neglect, visits for neglect, suffering for neglect. Well, another, this study funded by NIA and the National Institute for Nursing Research, Elder Neglect Assessment in the Emergency Department. I was working with Greg Pavisa and Evo Abraham, pilot study to conduct feasibility first. This was funded by the Commonwealth Fund, three-week period, 180 patients, uh, 70 were screened, 36 eligible, seven for neglect. Nurses were able to screen with 70% accuracy when you had the staff nurses screening for neglect, 
and then having them match it against uh, a nurse physician social worker expert team at the Mount Sinai Medical Center. Using those data, we then uh, uh, followed that up. But here, looking at Shields, Hunsecker, and Hunsecker in a study looking at mortality and morbidity, morbidity, morbidity of elders in a large metropolitan area, retrospective 10-year study of abuse and neglect, and clinical forensics. We heard Bob Wallace say that as well. Forensic medicine program, 74 postmortem cases, 22 suspected neglect, 30% of the people from neglect. I've often, as, a, as a clinician, I've often said I, I have seen people survive after they've been hit in the face, but you rarely see people survive if nobody feeds them or nobody um, uh, gives them uh, appropriate hydration. Most common cause here was bronchopneumonia, and I saw that uh, this particular study was cited once before today. I found no further papers from this group, and I'm hoping that somebody can tell me I'm wrong because it's just such an important thread to pick up. Here we have uh, uh, elder mistreatment in urban India, a community-based study where a probability study to identify cases, 400 older adults, 54, 56, 14% with mistreatment. But 4.3% reported neglect versus 5% physical abuse. And the point I'm trying to make here is so often we are horrified by physical abuse. I'm horrified by physical abuse. But when you're looking at the metrics and the, the, the parallels here, we really have to be asking ourselves how to take a look at that. Dyadic vulnerability, this followed our, initial, our original study, um, funded, this is funded by NIA. Uh, from February through September 03, screening five EDs. We had three emergency departments in New York City, two in Florida, looking at people over 70, 165 cases enrolled. And let me tell you, here's another thing that's interesting about this. We touched the shoulders or the lives or the charts of 3,153 patients in order to get ultimately 300 cases. And then followed them after follow-up, we got 165 cases where we could do the elder uh, caregiver dyadic interview. 3,153, 350, 165. I felt so horrible about this. I thought, what am I doing wrong? Until I heard uh, Harvey Cohen present on some VA data and his, his numbers. This work is hard, and this is the work we have to do. We have to get to the people. But we also have to ask ourselves, if we are tapping the shoulder of 3,000 people and getting 300, who are we missing? That's an important question. So our risk constructs, and we happen to use the risk and vulnerability uh, model for understanding elder abuse and neglect. That's the key point I wanted to make there. Uh, elder abuse in Korea, where Dr. O oh and colleagues looked at the prevalence, 15,000 older adults, 6.3% found to have experienced some kind of mistreatment, with 2.4% reporting neglect, very serious uh, amount. When we think about elder neglect in the pathophysiology of aging, Collins and Presnell told us about autopsy cases, yet another important way to understand what's going on in this mistreatment. And eight cases of suspected neglect were identified, um, uh, and five in the home, three in the institution, the causes of death, sepsis due to dehydration, decubitus ulcers. So that went back to work that Jane Ashley and I were looking at with factors for suspected elder mistreatment. And I didn't find follow-up studies here as well. Does anybody know about that or not? And Because I think I'm trying to say we're looking for follow-up on these things. The National Elder Mistreatment Study, Ron did a great job talking about it today, prevalence of 5.1% for potential neglect. And the association of cognitive function and risk here with Shinchi's work, very important work, looking at in cases of caregiver neglect, there's a significant increase of abuse from middle low in all four cognitive functions that were tested. So looking again and trying to zero in on associations between cognitive function and caregiver neglect. Personally, as somebody who's gone through many, many IRBs, and I'm sure you all have too, very often my work gets kicked out as um, not safe because they'll say, well, the person has cognitive impairment, so you really can't study them. Or they'll say, if the person enrolls in your study, they'll be put at risk by the person who's abusing or neglecting them. So I think that um, in the last minute or two that I have, the point I'm trying to make here is please focus on neglect. Please focus on neglect by other people. Um, I love the work that's gone on that, and that will follow in this panel. But try to remember that as we think about this, we have to consistently tease out what is neglect versus abuse. It all comes under the umbrella of mistreatment. And it's really, really important that we understand this phenomena as distinct from others. Um, 
our study that you heard Marie Bernard speak about, funded by the NIA, is where we looked at, we, we screened in busy primary care clinics, in dental clinics, and at the Bellevue uh, Geriatric Medical Clinic. And neglect, again, was the most prevalent subcategory that emerged from that research. So the take-home message is that the prevalence is very serious and important. If I were to be conservative, I'd say 4%, but I'm willing to say it's probably much higher than that. That it's, there are no intervention studies except the, the solid work that Carmel and Laura are doing. And, and I know that they're taking a look next at neglect specifically. It's extremely challenging to capture these cases in the clinical setting, very hard. But we heard also that there's probably it will benefit us to move a little bit away from only the prospect of uh, cohort studies and matching, uh, and that we need to redouble our energies because it is in those energetic moments that we save people from suffering, and that's what we're about today. Thank you.